Welcome to everyone. We're going to let people get in here for a minute. So if you'd like to just hang out and we'll be with you in just a minute. And welcome to the third speaker in the series. This is Hugh Safford. Where'd you get that picture of me? Is that one of my websites? I didn't, so I don't know. <laughs> so geographic trivia, can you name where that is? It's not in the US. <laughs> That's Lake Wanaka on the South Island of New Zealand. Uh -huh. Doing. We have about 25 people. And I guess for the people that are already here before people get, remember you can put questions uh, for the speaker in the chat and we will see how many we get to at the end. Oh. And uh, you can put your, your uh, name um, in the chat or where you're from. We've got about 30 people. All right. Seeing a bunch of names I recognize. That's good. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, I'm Larry Gunther with Tree Davis. I'll be your host for this third speaker in the climate series. Tonight we have Hugh Safford, who will discuss a very relevant topic, fire trends in California. But uh, before we introduce Hugh, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement offered by Lynn Nittler. Go ahead, Lynn. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes. Kachio Dihi, Band of Windwin Indians of the Kalusa Indian Community, Kletsil Dihi Windwin Nation, and Yochu Dihi Wintu Nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. There we go, awesome, thank you. Um, I couldn't unmute myself. So here we go with the technical difficulties, but overcoming them. 
So this ongoing climate series uh, has been hosted by the Quaker Meeting House, the YOLO Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice, and the Cool Davis Coalition. Uh, the talks began with noted climate science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson, a resident of Davis. And we have one speaker uh, remaining in the series on May 13th, Hermias Kabrab, who will talk about the Green Moo Deal. Uh, and now I'm honored to introduce one of the organizations I love most. Tree Davis. I am a board member of Tree Davis, and it's an amazing organization that helps keep us cool even as the climate, even as climate change progresses. I'm going to show a little video. So I'm going to share a screen. And share sound. Optimize. Okay, and that should do it. How can you help Tree Davis safeguard our urban ecosystems for future generations? Introducing the Climate Ready Landscape Initiative and Fellowship <clears throat> Program. We have incredible natural resources. Larry, it's not showing on the screen yet. Including. Okay. Why is it not? Aha, I have to push the share. Sorry about that. There we go. Now we're rolling. How can you help Tree Davis safeguard our urban ecosystems for future generations? Introducing the Climate Ready Landscape Initiative and Fellowship Program. We have incredible natural resources across Yolo County, including in our urban spaces. The urban tree canopy and understory environment are our primary connection to nature where we live, work, and play. Climate change projections indicate that over the next century, Yolo County will become hotter, changing the optimum temperature ranges for our local plant species palette and making ambient temperatures less comfortable for residents. The region is also projected to become drier with longer scorching summer conditions and less water availability. These climate change impacts are unsettling and threaten up to half of the current tree species in our shared urban landscape. But we are not powerless in the face of these threats. Many researchers and universities have outlined action steps for refining our urban plant species palette to meet the climate change conditions as they emerge. And Tree Davis is ready to help make these recommendations a reality. Working in partnership with UC Davis and local municipalities, Tree Davis is actively working to help generate new plant species palettes for our region. We've already begun planting climate-ready tree species across Davis city limits. Our next big step will be scaling up the planting frequency of climate-ready trees and reimagining the landscapes in which urban trees are planted. We aim to convert underused turf areas to understory plant communities that include native, and drought tolerant plants that will confer much greater ecological value and withstand greater heat. Investing in these climate ready landscapes will benefit everyone. By bringing plant diversity into our public green spaces, we will all enjoy more natural space in our neighborhoods. By including native understory species in the plant palette, Pollinators will have a mosaic of habitat patches across our urban setting. And by keeping green spaces green, we will safeguard the evapotranspirative cooling benefits that plants provide, acting as living air conditioners and shade resources across our town. Collectively, the Climate Ready Landscapes Initiative will improve the viability 
and resilience of our public landscapes and safeguard their benefits for future generations. We're also keeping community engagement at the heart of our initiative. We're creating a fellowship program that will bring community members together in the care and stewardship of the new climate ready landscapes, training the next generation of urban ecosystem stewards. So please join us today in keeping Yellow County a livable, vibrant, and green place to call home. Donate today to support Tree Davis and the climate ready landscapes of tomorrow. Thank you so much from your local leaders in planting trees and growing community. How can you help Tree Davis? Great, sorry about that. All right, so um, just a couple more words about Tree Davis. One of the great programs we have is called Community Canopy. This is a program in collaboration with the city of Davis and is funded by Prop 68 dollars. Over three planting seasons, uh, we will plant a thousand trees in the city of Davis, almost all of which are climate ready species and many were planted in underserved neighborhoods. We've had two planting seasons. Uh, one was during the pandemic and we have planted over 700 of the 1000 trees with one season yet to go. So we're, we're well on track. And I just wanna really give a shout out to Tree Davis and city of Davis staff who have kept us on track with the planning in spite of the pandemic. Um, Tree Davis is a almost totally volunteer run organization. So when we lost the ability to gather in large groups, it really changed things. All right, so on to our guest speaker. Hugh Safford is a regional ecologist for the USDA and a member of the research faculty in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. His work is increasingly timely and urgent as climate change impacts our vast California forests, and we have experienced that already. Last year, thousands of wildfires burned millions of acres of land in the United States. California, Washington, and Oregon had multiple large fires burning throughout the summer and the fall. The August fire complex, which was started by a lightning strike in the Mendocino National Forest was the largest wildfire in California history and burned for months. Hugh Safford in his role as a fire ecologist with the Forest Service will discuss the role that human influence, including climate change, may have on future wildfire seasons and how this will affect the ecosystems and management of wildfires. He will also discuss how wildfires may change ecosystems. So remember to go ahead and put your questions in the chat as you think of them, and we will be collecting those for the end of the talk. Um, so thank you so much. And Hugh, uh, uh, I'll let you take it from here. It's a lot. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to dive right into it. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm going to be summarizing current and projected trends in, uh, in fire and vegetation in California and um, have a lot of uh, data slides, but I think they're relatively easy to understand. I'm actually going to turn off my um, video when I run my presentation, but let's get see if I can get my screen shared first of all. See if we can do this right. Um, all right. So you can probably see, uh, tell me if you can uh, see the actual presentation per se. Yes. yes. Just a second here and I need to turn that into a, okay, how about that? Is it up now, the, the presentation there, there, there. itself? Yep, that's good. Fantastic. Okay, good, thanks. All right, great. Okay, so um, we're gonna start right away with the data slide. So here, this is the California trend in annual burned area from 1908 to uh, 2020. And I fitted it with a polynomial regression trend and also the five-year running mean, which is the dotted line. This is from the California Fire Perimeter Data Set, which is the world's most complete and most comprehensive data set on fire occurrence and area. It's missing about 10% of the burned area that's contributed by very small fires, but it's an incredible data set. No one else in the world has got anything like this. As you can see, burned area was relatively steady in California until about the 1980s. And this was largely the result of federal and state policies of fire exclusion. 
that were begun in the late 19th century in most of the state. Uh, and a big part of fire exclusion was uh, the removal of uh, Native Americans from the landscape and um, laws which forbade their use of uh, fire as a management tool. Um, we now know that that was an extremely short-sighted policy. Whoa, what's going on there? It shouldn't have happened. That was weird. I wonder if this is on a timer or something. Strange. Anyway, um, basically, um, all the, uh, I, I uh, got an arrow that notes in 1935 when the 10 a.m. rule was promulgated, which was this re required district rangers to extinguish any fires on their lands by 10 a.m. the next morning. And then, you know, after the Second World War, you had the addition of all sorts of newer technologies, right? Area water bombers, uh, mechanized equipment, and then the, the return of millions of young men to the United States after the Second World War. And these all played major roles in uh, the effectiveness of fire suppression. So what I've done here is I've telescoped uh, that graphic to the period uh, between 1980 and 2020, where most of the action is in that previous slide. The red circles represent years in which over a million acres burned in California. Sorry, all my, I'm a scientist, so all my graphics tend to be in metric, forgive me. <laughs> um, uh, but those six years with the red dots are the only years in the entire data set back uh, to 1908 in which over a million acres burned in California. And these six years uh, have all occurred since 1999. Note that three of the last four years have also reached this mark with 2020 reaching more than 4 million acres. When I show this graph to people, um, including you know, media, uh, policymakers, wow, this is on a timer, which is really strange. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Policymakers, media resource managers, you know, I don't know, a fire managers, basically the common response is always, oh my God, look at all of this fire and how can we keep California from burning up? But it's really important that you understand the trend in the context of California's long-term fire history. Um, the best estimates we have suggest that roughly about 18,000 square kilometers burned in the average year before 1850, which is when mass Euro-American settlement began right after the discovery of gold. So one year in this entire 112 year data set comes even remotely close to the levels of burning that characterized California for millennia before your American settlement. And that happens to be 2020 last year, the year that's been widely branded as a catastrophe or as a fire Armageddon. And I just, I wanna make clear to you in the audience that on average burned area in California most years continues to be far below what we might call normal levels. And that this lack of fire is actually a really important uh, factor of ecological degradation in the state's ecosystem. Speaking of the state as a whole, reducing burned area is actually the wrong measure of success, um, maybe except in uh, Great Basin and, and uh, chaparral shrublands on the coast, and certainly near urban areas, uh, such as a lot of Southern California and the Bay Area. But really the issue is how fires are burning and not how, how uh, much burned area we're seeing. So one of the real interesting nuances in the increasing area of fire in California is, essentially, is that essentially all the change is happening in the northern half of the state. And in this graphic, you can see that Southern California, um, which for decades has re really been a, I don't know, a poster child, I guess, um, a fire catastrophe in the US, it's seen no statistical increase in, in average burned area over the last 40 years. Uh, but since the 2000s began, the rise in burned area in, in the mostly forested landscapes of the Sierra Nevada, the North Coast Ranges and the Klamath Mountains has been nearly exponential. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna actually uh, just jump out of this for a second. I'm gonna stop sharing because I gotta figure out why this thing is. Um, there's some kind of timer going on here, which is weird. Okay, and I'm just gonna use this moment to remind everybody to do video and video during the presentation. Oh, here we go. Okay, I don't, wow, I've never had this happen before. This is really weird. I'm finding, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, okay, see if that'll work. Sorry about that. Okay, now, okay, so slide back up. No. Oh yeah, all right, I gotta share first. Uh, <laughs> all righty, hold on a second. Let's try this again. Okay, and how about now? Yep, there we go. Okay, good, fantastic. 
All right, anyway, so the point of the slide was just to make clear that basically all of the change in, in fire area in California has been in, in Northern California, north of Hatchapi since the 2000s. So one of the other real major differences between Northern California and Southern California is the way that humans have affected fire frequencies on the landscape. So this is a map of what we call fire return interval departure or FRID. And it compares uh, current fire frequencies computed over the, the last century, basically since 1911, to the fire frequencies that characterized ecosystems before Euro-American settlement. Areas in blue are landscapes where current fire frequencies are lower than before Euro-American settlement. And the dark blue areas are areas where fire has been nearly completely absent in the last 110 plus years, a recent uh, explosion of fire notwithstanding. The pa this pattern characterizes uh, what I'll refer to as uh, Northern California, but which for me, uh, in the essence of sort of uh, ecosystem patterns anyway, includes Northern California, but also the Sierra Nevada. And this pattern is occurring in landscapes uh, that are dominated by what, what I call formerly frequent fire forests or the F4 ecosystems. And these are things like oak woodland, yellow pine, mixed conifer, and some drier mixed evergreen systems. These uh, ecosystems used to uh, support extremely frequent fire every five to 15 years on average. And that fire burned at relatively low severity precisely due to all of the fire, which constantly reduced fuels on the landscape. Much of Southern California, on the other hand, which is what I'll call the area supporting the warm colors in the figure, is experiencing increased fire frequencies over the pre-settlement averages due to high densities of people and thus high levels of anthropogenic ignitions. This pattern is also coming to, ca uh, to characterize the Bay Area. Uh, although because there are no forest service lands near the Bay Area, we didn't analyze the region in this study, so it appears all white. You also note that in Southern California, there are some blue islands down there. Those are the Sky Island uh, forests that are found principally in the San Gabriels and the San Bernardino and San Jacinto Mountains. And these are essentially Southern outliers of Northern California vegetation where fire exclusion in those F4 ecosystems has resulted in a reduction of fire frequency. So basically you have very, very different situations in, in Northern and Southern California on average, largely fire suppression effects in, in forest types that used to experience a lot of fire in the Northern part of the state and enhanced ignition and enhanced fire effects and prevalence in Southern California. And this pattern now recently has expanded to Northern California. So since all the action is in Northern California, I'm gonna focus the, most of the rest of my presentation on that. And I'll use the Sierra Nevada framework area as a surrogate for the entire area since patterns are similar and really because I already had these data. And so on hand, it made it making the presentation a lot easier. Here, we're looking at not overall burned area, but rather the area that was burned at what we call high severity. Here, what I mean by high severity is uh, burning in which more than 90% of the tree biomass, or actually it's surrogate in this case, what we call basal area, was killed by fire. And in the inset photo, you can see an example of 100% tree mortality. As you can see at the beginning of the time series in the early 1980s, the area of stem replacing fire averaged about 10,000 hectares. This was notably higher than the average in the 40s, uh, 1940s to 1970s. But the regression line really begins to change in the 2000s. And currently it's about seven times greater than it was at the beginning of 1980. The red is just some estimates we had to make. We haven't finished collating the fires over the last couple of years. So again, I wanna put these numbers in context as I did before. The gray horizontal bar represents our best estimate of the total area burned at high severity in the Sierra Nevada framework area in typical years before Euro-American settlement. Until the late 1990s, burning um, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada framework area generally fell below that region. But beginning in the early 2000s, you start to see an inexorable rise. And in the last nine years, eight of them have burned areas at high severity that are well above the natural range of variation. And the, the regression lines now are more than three times higher than the pre-Euro-American settlement. So why is uh, fire severity climbing so strongly in Northern California? There's definitely a climate warming signal in the pattern, but the trend is really probably mostly driven by the long-term lack of fire. This graphic shows the proportion of fire area burning at high severity as a function of time since last fire in what we call yellow pine and mixed conifer forests or YPMC forests. This is uh, systems that historically were dominated by species like ponderosa pine, blue pine, blue pine, with smaller components, things like white fir and insect cedar. So why is there this strong relationship that you can see with the blue line, i.e. the longer between time, the longer the times between fire, the, the more severe the fires are? Basically because in the absence of fire, these ecosystems accumulate fuel. 
and the heavier the fuel loading, the bigger the bonfire. And it's telling that uh, the strongest climate warming trends are occurring in Southern California, but fire area and fire severity are not increasing there, they're increasing in Northern California. So what are the effects of these fire trends on old forests? Here are outputs from a simple model of fire succession uh, and fire dynamics that I built a while back. This is an aspatial state and transition model. And what it does is it links vegetation succession or serial stages with transitions that are driven by vegetation growth and also by the effects of fire. So what I did was I attributed the model with a fire frequency distribution that approximates uh, the pre-Euro-American settlement mean, uh, basically an average fire return interval of about 13 years. But then I ran two different uh, simulations. One simulation modeled fire severity based on pre-Euro-American settlement rates, which is about 6% high severity if you weighted by area. And then the other one I ran based on current severities, which are which in, when I did the model was about 32%, but these days it's closer to 40%. And as you can see, the outcomes of the two simulations are really different. If fires before Euro-American settlement had burned at the severities we see today, old growth forest would have been exceedingly rare on the landscape. The simulation took only 50 years to, re to reduce the landscape to only 20% old forest and 100 years to reduce it to five. The scenario incorporating the fire severities at which fires used to burn in California before fire suppression, which, rest which uh, represents the best estimates from the literature basically. Um, those values you can see there at 200 years, it ends up down at about 40% and that falls in the, in the range of old growth estimates from most of the literature that's out there. So the reason I built in and ran this model and then published it was that we run into suggestions periodically in the literature and in litigation for that matter, that modern fires are somehow nothing to worry about, that they've always burned this way, and that old growth dependent wildlife species are well adapted to huge stand replacing uh, fires. Basically, uh, under current patterns, old forest isn't really deep due to in California. So what about younger trees? So here are trends again in the Sierra Nevada framework area uh, in mean and maximum high severity patch size. So these are the uh, fires burn very heterogeneously in the landscape, right? And so um, patches in which all of the trees are killed uh, vary in size, but they've been getting larger over time. And you can see that the, the average size has increased by about 50% over the last 35 years, while maximum patch size has increased by about eight times. In the beginning of the 1980s, it was really rare for us to see high severity patches. Man, this thing is crazy, huh? That it just keeps uh, forwarding, but I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to stop it. Um, it was really rare to see high severity patches greater than about 1,000 hectares. Uh, but today we commonly see patches greater than 10,000 hectares. And just to give you an idea of the size of 10,000 hectares, that's about the size of the footprint of the city of San Francisco. So those kinds of large, huge areas uh, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And so really the question is, you know, what does that mean? What is the meaning of uh, these, uh, these trends in high severity fat sizes? This is a figure that's from a fascinating study done by Jen Stevens uh, and colleagues uh, in 2017. What it does is it takes the core area of these high severity burn patches, which they defined as the area falling more than 120 meters from the surrounding forest edge. And they accumulated the area in these patches as they were created by fire between 1984 and 2015. At the end of 2015, that area summed to 100,000 hectares, which is about 250,000 acres. And imagine if uh, we continued this uh, uh, process that they did, you know, adding the last five years of fire, which has have been giant fire years in California. The importance of the core area as defined by, by Stevens et al is basically that it represents the part of the burn landscape that's beyond the normal dispersal ca uh, capabilities of conifer species. Basically, it represents an area that's likely to remain tree free for a very long time. But it also represents the part of the burn landscape that's been withdrawn from the bank with respect to potential nesting or even foraging habitat for a lot of important wildlife species, such as the fisher, the spotted owl, and even the blackback woodpecker. There's actually been a lot of amazing science done recently on those species in just the last few years. And it shouldn't be surprising that their life histories are strongly connected to the fire and vegetation patterns that characterize this, these forests uh, for the millennia before your American arrival. So what does the future hold? A lot of fire. Every single fire projection we found in the literature predicts bigger fires, more fires, and more severe fires, basically until we've burned uh, so much of California that there actually really isn't much woody vegetation left to burn. Okay, yeah. 
So in terms of a, a, just a fire trend summary of this part of my presentation, I'll just simply note that um, one, overall burned areas are actually notably below pre-Euro-American settlement levels, but they're rising quickly. Secondly, Euro-Americans have drastically changed fire regimes in California. Um, uh, in, in the northern forests, largely by putting fires out, uh, but in coastal ecosystems, uh, actually largely by increasing ignition density. And three, these changes are leading to a rapid increase in fire severity in forested ecosystems. So that even though uh, the burned area is uh, overall is still in deficit, the areas burning at high severity are actually at a huge surplus. And this is not the good kind of surplus. So what do these trends mean for ecosystems? Major trends, uh, changes to fire regimes and their interactions with climate warming are having major consequences for ecosystems and their biota. And this includes things like uh, vegetation structure, increased drought stress and mortality, uh, changes to growth, uh, reproduction and dispersal, altered rates of nutrient and water cycling, and major carbon losses, increased erosion, and so on. So in my last few, few slides, I'm going to uh, cover how vegetation is changing uh, under these stresses and disturbances and how it's projected to change in the future as a function of fire and some of these other factors. These maps are outputs from a dynamic global vegetation model that was built by Oregon State and some Forest Service partners. It's been updated recently, but uh, I'm using this because I had already done these spatial summaries. Uh, the, the model models climate, vegetation succession, carbon dynamics, emissions, and fire. And I'm going to focus again on the Sierra Nevada framework area, which is basically that those black polygons. So in this bar graph, what I did is I took all the pixels from those mapped outputs and I summed them to provide an easier way to see projected vegetation. The three modeled climate scenarios are on the right, the current conditions on the left. Since we don't know exactly where climate is going, I, I guess what I mean is it's clear, it's obviously going to be warmer, but we're, our precipitation projections are still really, really variable. It's most useful to see what sort of, co of commonalities emerge among the scenarios because these three model scenarios are uh, you know, uh, relatively different future conditions. All of the scenarios pr uh, project major loss of subalpine and alpine habitat, some loss of conifer forest from major to minor loss, depending on the scenario, uh, largely to see conifer forest replaced by hardwood dominated forests and woodland. And that, what that is, is that's the cumulative, cumulative area of the light green and brown bars what, what in the legend is called mixed forest. And then an overall loss of shrubland due to highly frequent burning, especially at lower elevations. And probably most alarmingly for me, the, a huge increase in the area occupied by weedy grasslands that are the inevitable results of repeated high severity fire. And these are the sort of the light, light yellow or light tan colored bars in the, in the three right-hand scenario to compare them to the current on the left. If you, want to, if you take a trip to Southern California, you'll get a good feeling for uh, how quickly uh, large areas of shrubland and even forest can transition to huge areas of weeds and exotic grasslands. And we're starting to see similar patterns in the coast ranges uh, west of Davis, actually. So the modeling I summarized just now didn't take into account actual empirical changes that are happening on the landscape today. But you can compare Forest Service vegetation maps drawn in the 1930s versus the 2000s. And you can see that most of the projected changes are already underway. I'd like to acknowledge Jim Thorne from UC Davis for his work in digitizing the 1930s maps and normalizing the two data sets to the same, do two data sets to the same um, resolution uh, and the same vegetation typing. And I, I don't really have any time to spend on these, on these graphics, but I'll just note that in general, we see in terms of the actual real trend over the last 70 or 80 years, a notable loss of yellow pine forest mostly due to logging beetle driven mortality and transition to fur dominated forest that's driven by fire suppression. We see an increase in hardwood dominated forest, which is in that magenta color. And we see uh, thus far a relatively minor loss actually in subalpine forest. And of course a major loss in oak woodland, but that's not really driven by fire, that's driven by expanding housing pretty much. One other thing is that that's important to note is that the modeling that you find in the literature, literature uh, does not take into account all of the other stressors and disturbances that are interacting with fire and climate. And that's actually a, a really important, um, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's the right word, uh, uh, focus for uh, future research in California. And these things are going faster and faster. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we incorporate some of these other stressors, for example, bark beetles, 
uh, you know, pet effects, the effects of invasive, invasive grasses and their impacts to fire cycles, for example, because they, they're so easy to burn. The impacts, uh, the impacts of diseases like white pine blister rust or sudden oak death, um, drought, ozone, uh, pollution, nitrogen deposition, all these have major impacts on the, 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 the effects that fire has and climate has on, on vegetation and vegetation succession. So anyway, here are some examples of uh, some of these transitions on the landscape. Uh, bottom left, forest land transition, transitions to shrubland and grassland. The one on the left is on Laguna Mountain above San Diego uh, that saw a lot of the Jeffrey Pine Forest that's just barely holding on up there burn up uh, in the last couple of decades. And um, they're probably not going to get that back. They've tried to replant that site three or four times, and it's never taken. Photo on the, in the middle is uh, near Topaz Lake on the east side of the Sierra. This that whole mountain used to be covered in uh, pinyon pine and some Jeffrey pine, uh, but it's burned a couple of times recently um, from ignitions from the highway. And now all that tan in there is invasive grasses that have turned it into uh, uh, basically what saves pinyon pine from fire and sagebrush from fire in, in a properly functioning ecosystem is the fact that there's a lot of sand and dirt between the individual trees and individual shrubs. But now we've introduced cheatgrass, red brome, and some other species from uh, uh, Eurasia and the Mediterranean. <clears throat> they now create a contiguous fuel bed. So all it takes is someone dropping a cigarette or a lightning emission and you burn everything up again. So the mountains in that part of the Sierra are highly unlikely to see anything. And then the, the photo on the right is the standard situation in Southern California, which is that that landscape used to be covered in dense shrubland, coastal sage scrub and you know, uh, chaparral. And as you can see, it's just nothing but we, it, I, I can't even see a native species in that picture. Up in the hills in the back, I see some California sagebrush and maybe there's an, uh, uh, you know, a fiddle neck down below on the right. But basically everything there is just weeds because those sites burn so often from ignitions from the highway. I also want to note that, um, you know, fire exclusion is just as serious an ecosystem disturbance as uncharacteristically severe fire. A picture on the left, that's my son Daniel when he was a little guy. Uh, we were hiking a part of the PCT and you can see uh, the massive um, increase in density. All of the small trees are white fir that are fire intolerant and weren't, uh, weren't in that site when the Jeffrey Pine grew up. So this is a standard problem and a huge part of the Sierra Nevada and Klamath Mountains are increasingly dense forests that don't burn frequ frequently anymore. And they're now set up to burn at extremely high severity when they do encounter a fire. And then on the right, there's also a lot of meadow to forest land trans transitions going on because of uh, increased drought, dropping groundwater tables uh, mean that now trees can, can gain footholds in meadows that used to be too wet for them. Yeah. So uh, finally, uh, I'm just gonna describe a qualitative study I did with some coworkers back in the early 2000s. Some of you might remember that Southern California experienced a major drought at the beginning of the 2000s. That was essentially a dry run for the real serious drought that we, uh, we experienced in Northern California between 2012 and 2015. And a lot of trees died in this episode. And I was in a team of scientists that were, there was act, asked to project the likely effects of the drought on the ecosystems of the San Bernardino Mountain. One of the things that we did was to rank the major tree species in the forest there according to their susceptibilities to important stressors that were related to or interacted with, with the drought. And this graphic uh, stems from that work. And I won't go into too much detail, but I want to draw your attention to the circled species, which are those which are least susceptible to each of those stressors. Notice how often incense cedar shows up as the winner. We were amazed by this as incense cedar really isn't a dominant tree anywhere in California. Really, it's just an accessory species in mixed conifer forest. And these results suggested that incense cedar might be a more dominant presence, presence in Southern California conifer forests once these stressors had their way. Well, forest managers down there, frankly, thought we'd gone off the deep end. And I actually don't think our report ended up really being used in any, any significant way. But today, when you drive around the landscape between Lake Arrowhead, say, and Big Bear Lake, you're struck by the extraordinary density of incense cedar trees. Once all of its dead competitors were cut and removed from the forest, incense cedar emerged as the clear winner. And today you can see similar conditions emerging in the Southern Sierra Nevada as the millions of dead ponderosa and sugar pine and increasingly white and red fir, which are now dying due to um, fir, engraver, uh, fir engraver outbreak as those are carted off to the mill or as they fall dead on the forest floor. So current trends are not only changing forest structure and composition, uh, forest structure and function, but they're also changing composition as well. 
So um, basically in summary, fire is interacting with climate to provoke major changes in vegetation. Two, as fire regimes continue to change and as droughts deepen, conifer regeneration is becoming increasingly more difficult. If we're lucky, a lot of the landscape will succeed to hardwood dominated forests, but novel insects moving north from Southern California, such as the gold spotted oak borer, really worry me uh, in this respect. And also uh, the potential for sudden oak death to find its way into wetter stands in the Sierra Nevada as well. Three major structural and compositional changes are happening and are gonna, going to continue to happen in California conifer forests. A lot of areas dominated today by conifer forests will succeed to shrublands after recurring high severity fires. And in other places, shrublands are going to be lost to grassland as fire frequencies increase. Most worrying to me, it's likely that a lot of the lower eleva elevation ecosystems that are currently dominated by woody vegetation will transition to grassland as fire frequencies increase. This is going to have huge impacts on, on things like biota and services provided as well. Okay, so uh, my last slide uh, in, in the presentation is just I wanted to leave you with a couple of graphics that are a little more related to the socioeconomic impact of contemporary fire trends. In the last five years, fires have killed almost 200 Californians directly. Who knows how many the smoke killed? They've burned over 50,000 homes and other structures. Uh, they've cost more than $50 billion in insured losses. And of course they've choked the air with toxic levels of smoke. The false sense of security that decades of successful fire suppression have given Californians has led to huge amounts of growth in wildlands and agricultural landscapes that are actually under very high fire risk. Gradual but long-term changes in fuels and in climate are now catching up with us and the losses in homes, businesses, lives and health, are, is, are, they're gonna be a major issue in California and other Western states in the coming decades. This speaks to the need to uh, restore resilient and fire safe forests as quickly, uh, effectively and extensively as we can, and to begin to consider the real costs of largely unregulated housing expansion uh, in one of the world's most threatened landscapes. So that was, that's the end for my, uh, of my uh, talk that I planned on giving. Thanks a lot for listening. But I, um, I was out, I've been out a lot recently in field uh, on the LNU fire recently. We have a study going on looking at the impacts of the LNU fire, which was the giant fire that smoked us out in Davis for most of the summer, uh, of last summer. And I just wanted to show you some photos from that. I've got, I only have like seven or eight. So I'm doing a study with a graduate student of mine, and we're looking at the impacts of the outrageous uh, fire frequencies that are going on now in the coast ranges. Until the early 2000s, uh, fire was actually relatively rare in the intercoast range um, since the removal of Native American bird. But since 2007, this is uh, at uh, the Audubon uh, property, Bobcat Ranch, which is uh, just above Buda Creek, uh, Lake Berryessa is off to the right. Uh, this is about a thousand feet up above the canyon. And this site in the 1990s was a dense 10 foot tall stand of chaparral that you couldn't have made, made your way through it without a bulldozer. It, this site has now burned five times since 2007 and four times in the last seven years. And you can see the extreme amount of degradation that's gone on. Basically, we're watching before our eyes a formerly chaparral dominated landscape turn to, to weeds. Most of the green you're seeing on the site there is our European grasses. Um, and you can see how the low density of, of the chemise, uh, most of these are chemise shrubs and many of them are being killed. A lot of the things you're seeing there actually are not alive, they're just simply uh, the, skeletons of the shrubs. So this is actually Cache Creek. Uh, we're also doing work in the Cache Creek Canyon because it's burned. Also, there are places there that have burned seven times in the last 20 or 30 years. And this is looking to the west from a uh, 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 hilltop down below Fisk Peak. So, you know, kind of close to where the low water bridge is over Cache Creek when you just get into the canyon. And you can see actually, as you're looking out into the BLM lands, which this is all in the Snow Mountain, uh, various Snow Mountain National Monument. And you can see that the LNU actually uh, would burn a, a very patchily to the west of where I was, which is great because we're very keen on getting some sampling done in some of the chaparral that, that wasn't burned up in the LNU. I mean, it was an extraordinarily huge fire. Um, this is one of the sites I was at today, looking up at Fisk Peak from its uh, west side. Um, and you know, you can sad thing is you can see that uh, there were there was a lot of forested landscapes in there, and pretty much all of that was wiped out by the LNU. Even the riparian forest systems largely were burned pretty severely, and this the the trees will 
well, the pines won't, the, the gray pine is, that, that's all, all, almost always killed by fire. You can see some of them survive the fire on the left, but that'll have to come back through seeding. But uh, the oaks are of course resprouting, but you know, it'll be 50 plus years before they reach tree size, maybe, maybe longer than that. You can see in the foreground that this chaparral stand burned with extraordinary heat. This is another one looking down. This also, this was a site that it had not had any fire before the LNU fire hit in 2020 at least not in, in, in recorded history. And shrubs on this site, again, were eight to 10 feet tall. And this was an impenetrable mass, an impenetrable mass of chemise and toyon. And most of those skeletons are dead. I was amazed that uh, about, I'd say about 60% of the chemise actually was killed on the site. It kind of blew me away. Um, and then this is just looking at a standard where we do a bunch of plot subsampling and you can see that there's nothing in there. There's, there's one dead chemise on the right. There's a chemise that's resprouting on the left, but absolutely nothing in terms of any sort of fire followers, uh, herbs. This, this site just, it, it probably had a little bit to do with the meteorological conditions on the site, but it was also a site that probably hadn't burned for over a hundred years. So there was an extraordinarily amount of fuel on the site. This was kind of a cool area. There's a lot of Buckeye actually on North Slope here. Uh, and this was a forest. You can see some of the gray pine sticking up through it. When you get gray pine into oaks, uh, they tend to burn real hot. Pines, uh, they produce a lot of really flammable litter. They're full of resin. And uh, gray pine is actually not a fire adapted species really. In fact, where you find high densities of gray pine, it usually means the site hasn't burned for a really, really long time. And so when you burn a, an oak, woodland or oak forest that has a lot of pine in it and it invariably burns really, really hot. And again, I was surprised to find that quite a few of these oaks are not resprouting, kind of surprised me. Noting that, of course, last year was pretty dry and this year has been extremely dry. They might have something to do with it. So now I'm just gonna show you some flowers. There's still, are, I was surprised to find that given how warm it's been, that there actually still uh, is quite a bit of flowering going on. This is Lupinus microcarpus, um, right down by the low water bridge. That's, Castilea finis, that's uh, you know, one, of the, one of the Indian paintbrushes that's real common, kind of a somewhat shrubby form of, of paintbrush. This, uh, this is Clarkia unguiculata, one of my favorite Clarkias. Look at the petals on that thing. These guys were all over on uh, cut banks, uh, particularly along the trail on north slopes. Dry slopes, they were, they're gone at this point. That's ethereal spear, Tritelia loxa. That's also going off right now in Cache Creek. It's pretty much done flowering in Puda Creek, but Puda Creek, the, that canyon is just warmer. It's not as deep as the Cache Creek Canyon. You don't get such uh, topographic shading. And then, sorry, that one's out of focus, but seeing a lot of uh, fairy lanterns, this is Calicortis amabilis, one of the mariposa lilies. This is one of the hanging ones. And I think this is my final one. And this is California Celania or California catchfly, one of my favorite plants. I think that color is just shocking. But there's a lot of that stuff going on out there. So even though uh, the chaparral sites burn hot, that's the way chaparral burns. Um, and uh, there are a lot of species in these sites that are adapted to this kind of burning. So there's been uh, a pretty good flush of species uh, on a lot of the sites. I think that's the last photo. Yeah, anyway, I'll stop my sharing. Great. Thank you, Hugh. Um, that was that was a pretty incredible talk. A lot of, lot to chew over in that. Um, one of the things that did strike me most was that the frequency has actually gone down from you know pre-European settlement. So um, I guess that's from fire suppression and. Yeah, it's well, it's from fire exclusion, which includes uh, the cessation of Native American burning, but also, uh, you know, very effective application of human brute force and technology to put fires out that what you have to remember is that in that map that I showed you with the differences in fire frequencies today versus the way they would have looked before the 1850s that a, a lot of California was dominated by forest types that had an extraordinary amount of fire in them. Um, in the Sierra Nevada and in Eastern Klamath, a lot of that would have been lit by lightning ignitions. But California, actually, this is a little trivia uh, piece for you. California actually has the lowest lightning strike density of any state in the, in, in the US. And so once you get out of the highlands of the Sierra Nevada and the easternmost Klamath, you, easternmost, easternmost Klamath, you get into landscapes that lightning is not, uh, it doesn't produce fire. It's very rare that it does. And in fact, 2020 was, 
that's that's a pretty rare occurrence to have a sudden, you know, a big lightning outbreak happen across the coast in midsummer. That's common in you know, Colorado or New Mexico or Arizona, but it's not common in California. Most of the ignitions west of the Sierra Nevada would have been Native Americans. And you know, below maybe 4,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada as well would have been Native Americans. Anyway, um, so yeah, so essentially the issue in those forests is that it's, and it's, it's unique. Uh, well, it's not completely unique, but worldwide, that's a pretty rare situation. Humans usually result in a lot more fire in a landscape but in these systems, uh, because of uh, the perceived uh, value of timber and the fact that Euro-Americans, when they showed up in the, in the 1850s, and for that matter today, had absolutely no idea of how important fire was to the functioning of these ecosystems, and they feared it and felt like it was something they needed to stop. And after 100 years of that, it's really biting us in the butt now because now we've got jungles of fuels. We've cut most of the big fire-resilient trees out of the system. And when we get the ignitions now, we can't stop the fires anymore. Whereas until about the 1990s, it was easy to put fires out in these forests because you know, they, there's a gap between the surface and the canopy. They, they generally carry pretty quickly and the severity tended to be relatively low, but that's not the case anymore. Wow. Okay, so I'm gonna start, uh, I'm gonna jump to some questions that were put in the chat. Um, one from Nan is, uh, in Davis, we're blessed with an urban forest and in these drought conditions and higher temperatures, how vulnerable are these trees to high severity fires? Um, it's all, she also says that we're surrounded by agricultural land with orchards and annual crops and how vulnerable is the ag land to this high severity fire? Well, just uh, ag, ag land is, is not very vulnerable actually to burning. Uh, it can burn but only under really severe conditions because most agricultural crops are irrigated, right? So if you're talking orchards, vineyards, things like that, they tend to be uh, fire breaks. And we certainly saw that in the Santa Rosa fires in 2017. Typically when fire would hit a vineyard, it would stop or it would go in a different direction. Although not always. I did actually see a couple of vineyards that did burn up. Yeah. But um, those were vineyards where people hadn't been, um, you know, in other words, between the, the, the lines of vines, they actually had Fuels. In other words, they were letting the grass grow between them, for example. I'm not saying that's bad or good. That's just what it was. But um, yeah, I think Davis is pretty fire safe to be candid. I, it, would be, it would have to be just like a five-year drought where everyone had no more water. And so no one was watering any of the orchards. And then you had a giant wind event. I mean, it could happen. It's kind of stuff's happened in Greece, um, you know, where agricultural lands have burned up and, and towns have ended up uh, being impacted by burning. I think the biggest issue for tree survival in Davis is simply going to be drought. And, and, potent, and disease, right? So, because we're, of course, we are trans, trans, uh, tra um, transporting diseases all over the planet constantly. Right. I know that I live in the northeastern corner of town and um, along that sort of the green belt that goes around the Wild Horse Golf Course, um, a great trail that's had some beautiful restoration work done on it. Uh, you know, it's a little kind of a blue oak, uh, blue oak woodland corridor. There's a lot of sycamores that got planted away from the old irrigation ditch there and I don't think they're going to make it in the long run. They've, they've died back a couple of times the last few years. And I think that's the issue. And then, you know, anyone's got a birch in their front yard, I'd cut it now and replant. I mean, it's definitely gone. And uh, beetles get it if the water doesn't get it. So anything that needs water, I think, I think it's probably more drought than fire, at least for us. All right. All right. Um, so a uh, question from Karen, can you discuss the role of changed fire behavior with the increased heat within the atmosphere? Yeah, so sure, absolutely. I, I, one of the things I want to make really clear, um, uh, so climate, climate affects everything, right? Cl climate, to a, to a great extent, the world climate is, you know, that drives the ability for there to be living things <laughs> on the planet. So when people suggest that, and you hear this in the news a lot of times now, you know, someone will be interviewed about fire and it'll just be like, climate, 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 it's like, ah. Uh, there are a lot of factors involved and you know although we are cl clearly influencing the global climate there's not a whole lot that we can do in terms of immediate management yeah, other than you know to to modify climate but there's a lot that we can do to manage fuels and um so in certain ecosystem types fuels management is a major focus and needs to continue to be a major focus um anywhere people have got homes obviously human safety is a big issue as well but um 
you know, I think that, um, so forgive me, I got on a tangent there. Can you get me back on with the question? I just want to make sure I answer it specifically. Sure. Um, it was, let's see, I got to get back to it here. Um, discuss the role of change fire behavior with the yeah. increased heat within the atmosphere. Yeah. So anyway, my, my point was just that, I, so here, I'm sorry, this is the short version of what I was working on, is that when anymore, if you like, see anything on the news or read the New York Times or AP, I don't know why, but I think it happened during the Trump years, primary, to be honest, because there were climate deniers in the White House. They only call climate scientists now. They don't even call fire ecologists or people who work with fire. So you're always going to hear that it's nothing but the climate, <laughs> climate, 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 everything. Well, what, one of the things, the points I wanted to make in my presentation was that actually, I mean, clearly the baseline is shifting. It's getting warmer. We're still going to have cold years in the future, and we're still going to have really hot years, but we're probably going to have more of the latter. Um, Variability is going up a lot. Precipitation, actually, you may not believe this, but overall average precip has been going up in most of California over the last 40 to 50 years. It's just that we have huge highs and huge lows. And since summers are, are warmer, generally, even though we might get more rain in the winter, we're in California. We don't get rain in the summer. So summers are going to be drier no matter what we get. And the more rain we get in the winter, the more grass we have. So then that means, see, California is perfectly set up to grow lots of fuel in the winter, in early spring, and then dry it all out and burn it up in the summer. So basically, there's no question that warming has got, is playing a role in everything we're seeing. No question about it. However, the part of the state with the most severe warming is Southern California by far. It's not even close. And they haven't seen an increase in burned area or in fire severity, whereas we have in the north. And the big, the basic issue is that it's largely a fuels issue in Northern California. And the fuels are becoming very dry, but there's an outrageous amount of fuel in the landscape. And before I finish, I just want to make clear, to clarify for people, that that issue, the fuel accumulation is a huge issue in forests in the Sierra Nevada and at higher elevations in the, in the coast ranges. It's not a big issue in Chaparral. Chaparral is, it's a time bomb. That stuff just grows dense and thick. And in eight years, you've got the same shrub structure you had before fire. It's always burned that way. That's, that is a, a natural fire in Chaparral is one that you don't want to be anywhere around. And so, you know, re reducing fuels in Chaparral, actually, if you did it just generally speaking on landscapes, it would be, it would be ecosystem degradation. Whereas in a lot of the, the forest types, forest thinning is spot on. I mean, particularly if you can follow it with prescribed fire, because the forests are four to five times denser right now than they were when your Americans showed up. Wow. So wow. Where, where you need to do work in chaparral ecosystems is to protect human habitation largely and to try to reduce fire frequencies if at all possible. That, that, that's where the work is necessary. But in terms of broad scale, you know, like they were doing in SoCal in the 60s, 70s and 80s, trying to trans, you know, um, uh, uh, transmute, you know, entire landscapes from, from chaparral to grassland, for example, because they thought it was safer and they could also graze cattle on it. I mean, that was crazy. Right. So this uh, question is from Heather. It actually kind of piggybacks on that. Is, in what ways is the is government, federal, state, and local supporting indigenous groups in reinstituting controlled burn practices? That's such a great question. Um, so I would say that until now, it's really been probably more talk than anything, but you know how things go when you're talking about policy and federal and federal and state agencies for that matter. People have to start talking first. Um, and actually, there's been a huge, well, Heather may know this and people on the call may know it, but there's been a huge renaissance in uh, within the tribes and their interest in recuperating fire as a tool. And a lot of the tribes have basically completely lost their actual connection to fire, but some have maintained that. A lot, a lot of the Northwestern tribes and a lot of the smaller groups in the Sierra Nevada, for example, have continued to use fire at some level. And they've gotten real militant about wanting to begin to use it on you know, their cultural landscapes. And so the big issue, I think, is there are a couple of big issues. One is most indigenous burning was what we call cultural burning, right? So in other words, it wasn't like, well, okay, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going I'm to generalize grossly and then contradict myself. <laughs> um, they did do landscape burning. And in fact, when you uh, talk to tribal elders, read what literature there is out there and some of the early accounts of what indigenous peoples would do when they moved out of the highlands in the fall, right, as winter was coming, a lot of those tribes would actually just set fires behind them and they would just leave and walk east or walk west. 
and let the fires go east. And um, they burned at the right time of year as the rains were starting to come in, but they would underburn large areas of the landscape as they left it. It was too dangerous to do while they were living there. Now you can't do that anymore. <laughs> There's people there in roads and infrastructure and all sorts of other stuff, but they the did a lot of moved easily. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. So a lot of that went on, but there was a lot of, you know, more specific cultural burning, right? For specific purposes near cultural, like, uh, you know, near uh, community sites, like for uh, promoting certain types of plants uh, for food or for basket making or for whatever, um, for hunting, right? For defense, you know, uh, I've been reading this fascinating book called Alta California about uh, what the Spanish found along the, the west coast of California when they were, showed up in the 17, uh, 16 and 1700s. And, you know, I did not realize the extent to which grizzly bears were an insanely massive challenge for humans uh, in California. And they were like Kodiak bears. These were 15 to 1600 pound animals. And there were large portions of the, of the coastal landscapes that, that uh, Native Americans actually kind of stayed out of because they just couldn't deal with the, the grizzly threat. But fires, they used fires to, 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 um, to open up landscapes so they were safer, so they could make their way through the landscape safely. Anyway, a lot of that kind of stuff. So sorry, that, that was, that's not answering your question, but now I'll answer it. And that is that there's a ton of interest at the state level. In, the feds have the interest as well too, but it's gonna happen at the state level first. The state's wildfire resilience, uh, wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan, which just came out and which is a fascinating document, um, is has got a lot of focus on reinvigorating tribal use of fire and finding ways to use tribal knowledge in awesome. um, in expanding the use of prescribed fire. You know, human set controlled fire for ecological purposes on the landscape, and a lot of ra uh, ranchers, you know, small. Uh, uh, forest landowners as, as well in California are getting their qualifications for prescribed fire now. You didn't used to be able to do it, but the state passed a law a couple of years ago that essentially mm -hmm. arm twisted Cal Fire into uh, uh, setting up a system to train and certify private landowners in use of fire on their own landscape. So what I would say, if you're interested in it, go look at Australia because they've, they've gone way beyond us. They actually have indigenous peoples managing fire in some of their national parks, the northern part of the country. And they've had incredible success from the standpoint of all the ecosystem impacts or uh, effects that they were looking to, you know, to produce. So anyway, I, I, this is a great time to be interested in tribal use of fire because it's going to get, there's going to be a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, effort spent in trying to expand it. Okay. And the second part of that question was actually, what are, what are we doing now to change official policy? And it sounds like you kind of covered that um, by going back to indigenous practices, basically. Yeah, where it can be done, right? I mean, obviously, it's right. a challenge always because uh, uh, Native Americans who, uh, you know, they're like essentially uh, foreign nations, right? I mean, they're their own, they have their own national status. And so, right. you know, working out these arrangements is always a challenge in the U.S. But like I said, uh, using Australia as a guide, it can be done. And um, the, uh, I just will say that there are, there are a lot of efforts in a lot of places. The state expects to, to actually start a grant program for tribes to begin to use fire more often and more extensively. And I'll also say that at, at UC Davis, I, I just, um, the chair of the Native American Studies Department, Beth Rose Middleton and I just got money from USGS actually to hire a postdoc to look exactly into that issue. How can we expand cultural uh, native burning practices to landscapes that are large enough that they can actually make, make a difference in, in trying to solve our fuels problems? Um, and there is, a, there is a request, and I don't know the easiest way to do this, uh, but further reading is uh, a request. We're in a reading uh, culture here in Davis. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. <laughs> um, I don't know if that could, I mean, while you're talking, it'd be difficult to put that in the chat, but perhaps uh, if we could, maybe you could send a list to Cool Davis and we could, they could post that on their website. Sure, let me write that down. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, let's see. So what practices could the Forest Service explore to further protect old growth? Uh, or maybe what practices are they already exploring? Yeah, so one of the, <laughs> one of the really big challenges is trying to get people used to the fact that we actually have to cut 
a lot of trees. Yeah, and by the way, the, that chat question there, yeah, I sent the PDF to Chris. So the slides, they should be available to people. Um, we don't have a choice because uh, in a lot of the state, what you saw happen this past summer, well, a lot of the fires really weren't so bad. Like I would say the LNU, the huge fire that, that made our lives miserable all summer, I would say, I don't know, I'm making this up, but 80% of the landscape that burned in it, it's just, it doesn't, it looks normal. It's in, in a lot of the landscape, it's lamentable to have yet another fire already two years after the one before and two years after the one before that. It's too much fire. But in terms of its impact, it, it, it didn't surprise me. I've, I've been all over the fire and it mostly didn't surprise me what it found. However, <laughs> you go to the fires in the Sierra Nevada that burned this summer and it was, uh, specifically, or, or rather especially, the Creek Fire and the, the Castle Fire on the Sequoia National Forest. Oh my God, those, those are Hiroshima type landscapes. And what happened there was there was a four year drought in which that giant beetle outbreak happened and killed whatever, 200 million you know, ponderosa pine or whatever it was. And those things are dead standing there and a lot of them have fallen and starting to hit the ground now. And so there's just a gigantic bonfire of 20 to 60 inch trees that are falling over and wow. Jack straw. I mean, they had 2000 tons an acre of giant fuels on a lot of that landscape when those fires went through there. And I mean, it was like an autoclave, basically, uh, what it did uh, to the soil. And, you know, what people have got to understand is that uh, unless, it, well, I mean, I could go on for hours on this because the, it's a really complex problem. It's, right, there's right. no simple answer to any of it because nothing happens in US management circles unless someone can make a profit from it. Nothing happens. We're not a command economy. So since we're not a command economy, you have to create economic markets by subsidization and, and legal methods, legislative methods that promote you know, business practices and, and, and other kinds of practices that lead to sustainable ecosystems. And right now we're looking at hundred years of fuels accumulation in these forests that ain't gonna get fixed by just standing there and watching it because they're just gonna burn up and get vaporized. And with the climate warming, that's the scariest part of the whole climate warming climate thing is we're not, we're, it's, it's you know these kind of summers that we used to have where you'd have a cool summer and everyone would be psyched about it. Good luck, those aren't gonna be happening much in the future. And when we get fires in these kinds of ecosystems, they're gonna create ecosystem transitions. You're gonna lose your conifers. You'll be lucky you might get hardwoods back in there. That would be great. But now, like I said, with gold spotted oak borer, sudden oak death, all these other things killing uh, oaks all over the coast in Southern California, and they're both headed our way in the Sierra, I get worried about that. So people have got to get over their, uh, their resistance to the need to have a functioning forest products industry in California. And one that's not tied to cutting giant trees, but cutting small and medium trees of non-pine species and removing fuels. And you know, a lot of the world has a biomass. Like you go to Scandinavia, there are cities of 150,000 that are totally run off of bio, a high efficiency biomass burning that has very little in the way of you know, carbon emissions. That kind of stuff can be done in California too. And we used to have a lot of bioenergy uh, energy production in the state, but with cheap gas, cheap oil, and you know, all of the um, solar and wind coming online, it, it is absolutely uncompetitive unless you subsidize it. So that happens in Europe. There's a ton of subsidization for, for that kind of stuff. So anyway, you know, you think about it. We got a highway system. How do we have that? Well, the government subsidizes the hell out of it, right? right. It wouldn't exist right. if it weren't for that. So decisions have to be made about whether we care about having forested landscapes in the state. Because if we do, we have to develop economic incentives to do work. And the final thing I'll say is, this whole wildfire and forest resilience action plan that the state put out, you know, the first thing that they did was they signed an agreement with the U.S. Department, with the Forest Service nationally to, you know, massively increase the amount of land that they are, that we're treating in the state, right? I mean, I, the agreement was, I think, for California to up it to about a half million acres a year and the Forest Service to up it to a half million acres a year ago million acres of, for, of, of treatment, a lot of which will be forest treatment. And a lot of it, you know, it'll be prescribed fire, it'll be some thinning, some fuel reduction, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of people are freaking out about that. But what I wanted to show you in the slides was that a million acres is about a quarter of the need. I mean, this state used to see 
four or five million acres burn in a typical year before Euro Americans filled the state after 1849. We haven't had burning like that in any year except for last year. And think about how everyone freaked out when it happened. Get used to it because that is a normal year. If you go back the last 10,000 years in California, that's a normal burning year. That's the first one we've had in, uh, in, you know, in memory. And if, it's going to happen. Not little we can do about it. So what we can do is we can you know, create forest conditions that are likely to survive those, or we can just sit around and watch it all, you know, vaporize. That was actually probably the most, I don't know, thought inspiring new fact that I had did not know was that this last year was actually more or less normal. The severities, yeah. I guess, are very different than- Oh yeah, no, it's burned, but yeah, the, for, the but, forest fires in this year are burned much harder than we would like them to. The coast range, like I said, actually, although there were some hot redwood fires, most of the coast range fires weren't ecologically speaking as an ecologist they didn't worry me really the, the sierra forest they, those worried me um yeah so that kind of covers uh john's question about what can we do besides prescribed burns um roberta asked can you say more about the implications of a shift from conifers to hardwoods is that expected up and down the entire west coast yeah in the long run it would be I mean, right now we're at the southern end, right, of it. So where the warming's really happening is SoCal. It's happening moderately in Northern California, and it's just starting in Oregon and Washington, in terms of being a major issue. But it'll it'll roll north. I mean, just drive down the coast, right? You already know what the climate's like, right? Drive into Baja, and you can see what SoCal is going to look like. I mean, so I mean, just think about. Well, here's one way that I. Some of you may have heard this before if you've seen me give a talk before because I overuse this analogy. But anyway. Um, or this, this little vignette. But a Davis, the average July high in Davis is 93. It's probably getting closer to 94 degrees, right? That's just your standard July 4 p.m. high. So if you look at climate warming projections, um, they're suggesting that we're looking at seven, eight, nine degrees Fahrenheit more by the end of the century. And a lot of people just go, okay, so 93 plus nine, that's 102, maybe 103 degrees, something like that. You know, if that happens every once in a while, I can deal with that. We already have that. <laughs> so you got, there's this great graphic. In fact, I'm trying to think who, where did I saw it? You may have shown it. Um, the, yesterday when we were talking, someone showed it, it was like the, the number of days over 90 degrees or something in Sacramento. And that, that, that line is unbelievable. It's doubled in the last 20 or 30 years. And Think about that. Where in the U.S. has an average July high of 103 degrees right now? Can you name a city? Phoenix. Yes, <laughs> Phoenix. That's what it is. Phoenix has an average July high of 103. So if you stand in Phoenix and just on one of those big buildings and kind of rotate, it doesn't look like the Central Valley. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no. that's a freaking desert. That's where we're going. I mean, that is where Central California is headed. It's going to look like the area around Ensenada or around Mexicali. That's where it's going. In 100 years, it's going to look like that. Um, and there's probably just little we can do about it if we don't stop emitting carbon now and if we don't start adapting our forests through progressive management to try to at least hold on to some of them on some north slopes in some places. But that's where it's going. So um, I, I hate to I, I be the bearer of bad news, but... Well, if we stop carbon emissions, you know, we, hopefully we can at least slow them. But we're, you, you guys know we're already locked into this, right? Even if we stopped everything right now because of the residence time of carbon, we're looking at 20, 30 years of warming, even if we stopped everything right now. So I'm just, my, my the job that I, the role that I play as an outreach and applied scientist is to try to get people to understand the implications of what we're doing and to understand too that there are actually a lot of things that we can do to make the future better, even if it continues to warm. But you know what? It's, and they're not hard choices, really. We just need to do them. And the main one is thinning forests at a, at a huge scale. And not just because we can't cut most of the forests, because a lot of them are in wilderness, a lot are too steep, a lot don't have any road access. A lot of it, we're going to have to just start naturally ignited fires. We're going to have to let them burn if, if they're under the right conditions. You know, you get a cool summer. Fantastic. We should be letting fires burn all over California. It's going to create a whole lot of smoke inhalation issues for people. Right. But unless we reduce fuels, we're going to lose those for us. Right. So uh, Bruce asks, what are the implications for the redwood forests? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. And I would have said, so I actually did an interview. I don't know if you guys saw the New York Times had a, a, a piece written 
maybe three, two, three months ago. It was kind of a cool one. It was it was focused on uh, the 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 the, uh, uh, the writer when he contacted me. He's wanted to talk about redwood, giant sequoia, and Joshua tree because they were just they're like the California iconic trees, right? When everyone thinks of California, those are the three trees they think of. And I thought it was kind of a neat idea. And he interviewed a bunch of people. And in fact, I didn't even end up in the piece because he interviewed me. But I told him, I said, look, Joshua Tree resprouts. It's in the desert. I don't know if I'd put that in my top top of my list. But you know, now I found out that a lot of them aren't resprouting because it's been so damn dry in SoCal for so many years now. And then then I said, you know, redwood redwood is supernatural. Throw whatever you want to at it. It comes back no problem. Really? Well, okay. yeah, I mean, it resprouts from anything, just yeah. about right, and it has insanely thick bark. All those things. Fire actually benefits redwood usually because it kills all its competitors. Giant sequoias the same way. They love fire. However, this summer we actually saw, particularly in giant sequoia, really high mortality. This is the first time that any of us have seen high mortality in giant sequoia. We, it's you know, uh, Nate Stevenson from USGS was telling me, uh, you know, I don't know, it was like three four months ago we were just chatting, and he said that before last year, only like six to 10% of all the uh, giant sequoia groves had burned in the previous X number of decades, which on its own was a disaster because you can't get regeneration of giant sequoia unless you burn the stand. And so the fact that we're always running off to protect giant sequoia from fire was one of the dumbest things I'd ever heard. However, all of a sudden beetles that never had, that giant sequoia never had issues with are starting to kill them because they're stressed by drought. And now these, these two fires, the creek and the castle, now something like 80 or 60 or 70 percent of all giant sequoia groves have been burned in just the last couple of years and there are a lot of the big monarch trees were killed by fire I, it blew my mind it's a completely new world so that gets me to redwood redwood is like i said it's really supernatural it's like from another planet i mean that thing is adapted to just about anything if you think about it it grows in the fog belt right so actually redwood grows in the part of the state that does not have non-human fire ignitions it just doesn't it's really rare to have them we had them last year so that, you know, but it was almost entirely burned by Native Americans. And so you look at the fire scar record, you know, the tree rings and the fire scars on redwoods, there's a, an incredible amount of fire in those over the last couple thousand years, but it is all set by Native Americans, all of it, right? So it's a tree that can take advantage of nearly any situation. So I was on a, uh, gave a presentation to Cal State Parks uh, annual meeting, um, maybe it was about a month ago, about a half ago, about a half ago. And after I talked, they had three park uh, superintendents from the Central Coast talk, and two of them had uh, large areas of redwood. One of them had mostly underburning and really great effects. The other one actually had canopy, crown fire in redwoods, which is something that is rare. Wow. And um, so they had different experiences, and they said that they had actually seen redwoods killed by fire, which is something that they had not seen in big trees previously. And then let me, let me just finish with one last thing. Sudden oak death is actually a big issue in this respect. The reason for that is, is that redwood typically grows with tan oak and other oaks, right? Well, that sudden oak death is just whacking tan oak and post live oak uh, all over uh, the coast. And as a result now, you're starting to get high fuel loads of dead oaks falling down in jack strawing in redwood stands. And there's been some really fascinating science done uh, mostly by Dave Rizzo's lab at, and, and, and colleagues at, at UC Davis. And they've shown, and, and there've been some folks at Humboldt State too and, and UC Cooperative Extension who worked in this, but they've shown that the accumulation of fuels from dying tan oak is actually a pretty serious threat uh, to redwoods. I, so, but anyway, so sorry, that was a lot, all my answers are long. You probably recognize that by now, but um, the, the, I would just say that to me, I still think that the major issue for redwoods is going to be what happens with fog. And I don't think we know. I've heard people say, oh, you know, there's less fog. Well, you know, trends go like this, right? There's cycles all the time. And so whether that's a, an actual directional trend, I don't think any of us know. And with a warming, with the warming land, you know, fog's created by a temperature differential between right. the ocean and the land, right? So it, it, it depends totally on, you know, the difference, the difference in warming, which one's warming faster. If they become closer in temperature, then you'll get less fog. If right. they become more different in temperature, then you could have more fog. Right. So I don't know. But I, anyway, sorry, long answer. Yeah, yeah that's why we all have sweatshirts <laughs> that say Berkeley in San Francisco, right? Because it's the hottest 
it, it's hot in the valley and we go to the coast it's like oh my god it's freezing yeah Exactly, um, so exactly I don't right. know how much time uh, you've got, if you still want to answer a few questions or if... Uh, yeah, I can answer. I, I think I said I'd stay until 8.30 or something like that. That's fine. Okay. So we'll let uh, people have that. And um, so one question uh, actually that I had, and you talked about it some, and especially I was interested in... So it's become a two-part question. So how has the severity of recent fires changed natural forest regeneration? And why, I don't know how to ask the question, why don't native grasses come back as well as uh, exotics? So the first one was tree regeneration. Um, actually, we have, um, we've done a lot of science on that. My lab's done a lot of science looking at regeneration of specifically of Sierra Nevada, well, Sierra Nevada and Klamath Mountain conifers after these very severe fires. And here's the issue is the biota that, that inhabit an ecosystem are there because their adaptations uh, give them survivability uh, and allow them to maintain you know, sufficiently large populations to stay on site. So it's completely driven by their adaptations to the local climate, the local soil, and the local disturbance regimes, right? So these forests uh, that were common in the Sierra Nevada, the Western, uh, the Eastern Klamath, and you know, a lot of Western uh, uh, mountainous areas, particularly south of, you know, uh, eastern Oregon and then south of Colorado and in New Mexico and Arizona and California, they were dominated by tree species that were, that it were supremely adapted to really high frequency of fire that was a very low flame lanes and basically didn't do very much except kill the regeneration of their competitors in the understory. So they have really thick bark. They have needles that are extremely flammable. Uh, their cones are really flammable. And a ponderosa pine uh, and sugar pine, they also self-prune their lower branches. I don't know if you've noticed that, but you ever seen a big old giant ponderosa pine? There could be no branches at all for 30, 40, 50 feet up in the tree. And so they literally self-prune. Why? Because that way, these low, like, low uh, flame lane fires that were common in the system don't get into their canopy, right? So they're supremely well set up for that. Whereas white fir, incense cedar, yeah, some of the other firs and they're, they have can their their canopy goes right to the ground typically, and so anything that comes through is going to burn their canopy up. So, basically, since high severity fire was not evolutionarily a really common thing in these forests, they don't have any adaptations for it. So the the, the chief the chief adaptation that trees will tend to have if they're in a in a system where when it burns it's like okay we're all going to die is they have serotonous cones, right? So serotonous serotony is where You've got a cone, your, your cone where your seeds are in, that they're sealed somehow. There are a variety of ways, but typically it might be through some kind of resin, right? So knob cone pine has that. Rocky Mountain Lodgepole pine has that. Some Southern California conifers have it as well. And basically, they're living in a system where fire is actually relatively infrequent. But when it does burn, it's going to kill everything above ground. That's a chaparral fire. That's what it's about. And so knob cone pine grows with chaparral. Ultra pine grows with chaparral, right? So they're they're well set up. Mommy dies, but the codes open, and then they get this incredible seed bed with no competition to start life in, right? There aren't any of those in the Sierra Nevada. There's knob cone pine there, but it's really rare. So when you burn these systems really, really hot and kill all the above ground biomass, there's no seed source. The seed source has to come from the nearest living trees. And that's why the data I was showing you on, on the patch sizes of high severe fire is so it is so important because. Even though they have little wings on them, they don't go very far. I mean, ponderosa pine seed is lucky to go 150 feet. It's really lucky under a really high wind. There are some critters that move some of these a little bit further, but basically the interior of these huge patches, you're not gonna get forest back in these systems for, for you know a century is what you're gonna be looking at. And they gotta compete with the dense shrubs that come up in these systems in, in California and these kind of places. So. That's the issue. And so we actually have done a lot of science on that, looking at the densities of natural seeding and what's happening. And almost 50% of thousands of plots we've sampled in California have had zero conifer regeneration after fire, not any seedlings of any kind. Wow. So that's a big issue for long-term sustainability. It, 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 you know, it augurs for planting, but there's no money. The Forest Service is a teeny agency and the Forest Service has the same staff as O'Hare International Airport for the entire country. So, you know, maybe people upstairs might think about, you know, sending a little bit more money to try to solve these problems. But in Chaparral, it's different. Species are, are 
exactly adapted to that kind of fire. Hence, you have all these fire followers, right? They've got these seeds, they sit underground for 60 years waiting for a fire. And until it gets hot enough to crack the seed coat, they won't even germinate. Plus that's where your serotonous cypresses and pine seeds are too. So it has to do with changing disturbance regime. How species are adapted to a specific disturbance regime. If you make a big change in it, you're gonna create major changes in the ecosystem. And so that's the grass part of the question. Grasses like redwoods, they're superhuman. They can deal with anything just about, right? I mean, they, they're they great at uh, their, their ability, well, particular perennials, their ability to re-sprout, hiding the meristem down kind of in a thick bunch of tissue down near the ground, protects them against cold, against grazing, against fire, against, you know, you name it, whatever. Um, the deal with the European grasses is this, that uh, first of all, the Mediterranean basin in California are outrageously similar. I mean, you're talking the same ecosystems, the same climate, the same basic plant groups, right, pines, right. oaks, you know, chaparral type ecosystems, madrones, you know, uh, you know, baser myrtles. It, it goes on and on and on. It's incredible how similar they are. And the main difference is this. The Mediterranean basin has had humans living in it for tens and tens and tens of thousands of years, right? I mean, I don't remember when the first, you know, Middle East had people already at 100,000 plus. So they, the, the Mediterranean basin has had, forgive the French, but it's had the hell kicked out of it by people forever. Right. They've been burning it and cutting it and grazing it and, and basically messing with it. And so anything that couldn't deal with nonstop humans trampling them and killing them and eating them, it was gone 2000 years ago. Everything there is an outrageous survivor. I mean, you look at like, they're oak species. You can cut them and burn them and pour gasoline on them and they just keep coming back and keep re-sprouting. And their weeds are crazy. And their weeds have filled all of the Mediterranean climate zones on the planet because all the other ones were settled. Well, Australia is an exception, uh, but all of the Southern hemisphere ones were settled very recently. Well, sorry, South Africa also doesn't really count. Um, but so grasses just, they do fantastic with disturbances in particular annual grasses. Uh, and annual grasses that have seeds that can survive some heat. Now, in a normal chaparral fire, uh, in other words, you've got normal in chaparral means it's actually not burning very often. Maybe every 30 to 100 years is actually the standard, uh, sort of would be a natural fire frequency in chaparral. You've got a lot of fuel on that site. So when they burn, they burn real hot. And a, and a chaparral fire in that kind of stand, it kills all the grass seed. So what you get is you get a site usually that's a ton of bare soil and what comes up are all the native geophytes and, you know, and forbs and things. And then you'll get some, obviously some grass seed will come in on the wind during the course of the winter and stuff. And so you get a little of it. By, by year two, you'll start to get more of a grass pulse. But then the shrubs are coming back. And by year three or four, they've already started to close canopy already and the grasses are already gone. So chaparral is actually highly resistant to invasion as long as you don't burn it every two, three or four years. Once you start doing that, you're done. And, and that's what's happened in, in, in a lot of the Puda Creek Canyon is when you're driving that canyon, it's hard to believe, but when you get by the boulders there and go left uh, kind of just, you know, maybe a mile down the road from that Puda Creek, you know, RV place there right before the bridge below the dam, mm -hmm. those hills up on the right were mostly chaparral in the 1990s. Look at them now. <laughs> they're just they're grass the oaks are loving it because they can deal with it but i mean it's grass is just a fantastic disturbance tolerance right so it's the last man last last toughest species standing i guess yeah it, no exactly i think that's wow. exactly what it is all right um well it is uh just about 8 30 um so i think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you, Hugh, for so much. This was great. And the question and answer session was, uh, was lively and, and very informative as well. Good. So, well, you, you have my presentation and I will, um, you know, it'll probably be sometime this weekend, but I can put together just a little bit of a, a reading list on some of these things. But I can see the names I'm seeing in the, 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 uh, the screen in front of me. And these people who know, some of them know a lot more about some of these things than I do. So <laughs> I cast them. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's an issue about, you know, being in a college town. You got to really be careful what you say because, yeah. The <laughs> right. Yeah, I've learned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so thank everybody and thank you again, Hugh. That's It's really great that we've got you doing your work right now because we need it. Um, of course, moving that up into the policy stream is, is important. 
Um, and thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, it was a very lively discussion. Um, and we'll be thinking about this talk in the coming months. Next very summer. Yeah, this summer. Hopefully not too much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This, uh, it will be recorded and available on the Cool Davis website. So when things get hot and smoky again, we can all come back and go, yep, see, he said that's <laughs> I told you so. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that, and be sure to register for the next Cool Davis talk, uh, which is February 13th. And again, it's Hermias Cabral um, talking about the Green Moo Deal. So thank everybody again, and we will see y'all in two weeks. All right. Thank you, Hugh.